Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH. Recently it was found that many hard drives are using SMR technology instead of more conventional recording technologies. And this story really kind of broke and was covered a lot by Chris at Blocks and Files. And he's done a really good job of kind of getting to the bottom of this. So we're gonna give him credit where credit's due. Now, when first the first reports of this started happening, we saw it on Reddit. We actually had people in our forums talking about it and we had just started a project where we're gonna look at the difference between using something more like a RAID system versus a more scale out file system for NAS, really in the SMB and high end home segment. And particularly the story is about Western digital drives and we had just purchased a bunch of drives to be able to go do this story. In the meantime, it came out that it wasn't just Western digital using SMR surreptitiously, but also Toshiba and Seagate as well. In this video, we wanted to go through first a little bit about background around SMR and why it's important. We wanted to go through some of the perspectives that are involved because it seems like that's kind of getting missed in a lot of this. And then finally, what might be a resolution for it? So let's start with a really short SMR history and background. Now, I don't want to go into the nitty gritty technical details. Instead, what I'm going to do is tell you, just go look at a paper. There's a great paper actually by Toshiba that I think in less than four pages or four pages, whatever it is, goes through and really kind of explains the technology and why it's important, what it does, how it works. And so if you want to do that, we're just going to link that in the description. We're also going to have that in the STH main site article that's going to accompany this video. The really simple answer in terms of what happens is that the recording technology used in SMR drives is able to use a different write pattern and actually fit more data or more aerial density onto the platters of disks. As a result, you get higher capacity disks, but on the negative side, you get some kind of different performance characteristics. Specifically, random write workloads can see some pretty significant changes in terms of their performance characteristics when you look at them compared to more conventional drives. So something that drive vendors do to kind of shield users from this behavior is that they actually have something that's kind of like an SSD cache. So if you think of a modern QLC SSD where you have the kind of slow NAND, the QLC NAND, that is high capacity or higher capacity, but has some kind of not so great performance characteristics necessarily. You can actually have a portion of that NAND die that's set aside for SLC. You write data to that SLC very fast. And then when the drive doesn't have any more writes that it's absorbing, it's able to go and migrate the data from the SLC sections of the drive to the QLC section of the drive. Same kind of idea where you have more on an SMR hard drive, you actually have kind of a more conventional area where data can be ingested and held at relatively decent performance, kind of normal performance for a hard drive. But then later on, it can be migrated to the SMR portion of the drive. And that's basically why this is a big deal, because if you overwrite how much you can actually fit into that kind of cache area, then all of a sudden you go from something that's predictable performance and you get into this wild west in terms of quality of service. And why this is a big deal is that in RAID arrays, you kind of need to know if you're going to have a wildly varied quality of service. Now, RAID arrays have been around for decades. I mean, it's literally, if you look at RAID, RAID technology, it has been around for decades. And there are some newer options. You could say like ZFS just made its way into a major Linux distribution yesterday. And guess what? ZFS has been around for a long time too. The reason for that is that RAID is fairly easy to understand and it's a fairly, you know, it's basically a commodity technology at this point. But the bigger thing is that it's able to maintain trust. People have had drives fail in RAID arrays. They've been able to rebuild those arrays. They've had RAID arrays where they've been able to expand capacity. And so it's a known quantity. People are generally okay with the fact that it exists and how it works. In storage, reliability and that trust in your storage system is a big deal. I mean, if you think about it, just how many storage startups have fallen by the wayside because we have a great solution, but it takes so long for people to be able to trust that data is going to be stored securely, that we're not going to have data loss and people aren't going to lose their jobs by selecting a startup versus a big player like a Dell EMC or a NetApp. So the fact of the matter is we're kind of locked into using these RAID technologies that were developed years ago with CMR drives or conventional magnetic recording drives. And that's just widely deployed and people aren't really thinking about, oh, how do I go put an SMR drive into that? Because the SMR drives came at a point in time when the people using SMR drives were really using more advanced and newer storage paradigms. So if you look at where SMR technology is used, it's really popular in places like hyperscale customers. There's also large storage vendors that use it because those are the companies that really have control of building a software stack that's able to take innovations like SMR technology 
and drive real cost savings from the technology while still making it very usable for their overall system architecture. Basically, SMR technology came in after traditional RAID arrays and the people that are really using it are not using those traditional RAID arrays. So when we look at the overall market, you kind of see that SMR is really presented to host in three different ways. The first way that, that it's shown is in what's called a host managed mode. And that's really the best way that is possible, right? Really, you have these hyperscalers with their software. You have large storage vendors that are able to say, okay, I know we have an SMR drive. Therefore, this is how we're going to manage data being written and read from that drive. That is a great solution, and that's really the best case for SMR. There's a host-aware SMR where the host actually knows it's an SMR drive, but can still issue commands regularly. And then there's the class of devices that we're really talking about here, which are drive-managed SMR or DMSMR drives. There, the host doesn't even necessarily know that it has an SMR drive, and it's really actually kind of hard to tell that you have an SMR drive. And because of that, the host just writes to it as normal. And when you have very low loads on a hard drive, you pretty much don't notice the difference because most of your access pattern or your write access pattern is getting into that kind of cache layer of the drive. And so you never really kind of see the SMR performance impacts. So not only are drives not telling systems that they're necessarily an SMR drive, but when you go buy a drive, perhaps the bigger issue is the fact that the vendors were not disclosing the fact that they were actually selling DM SMR drives instead of more conventional drives. If you think about what that means for a customer, that means that you can go look at a drive that even in previous generations was a CMR drive, and you can say, okay, I'm gonna purchase that drive and have no idea that you actually purchased something that's an SMR drive that may have issues in RAID rebuilds or online capacity expansion operations. You'll have no idea that that's the case until you actually test it. That brings up a couple of issues, but it also, it kind of makes sense in some ways as well. So what we wanted to do was look at the perspective, both of a large hard drive manufacturer, but also of you know some of the customers that are really in this class. Because I think what's happening, at least when you kind of look at the dialogue and what companies are putting out, is that there's a pretty big disconnect between the two perspectives. So let's start with the drive manufacturer because it's actually a little bit easier. They're not putting SMR drives into these segments because they're saying, hey, they're better performance. They're not saying, you know, we're gonna put these drives into the segments that we are because, I don't know, they're more reliable or anything like that, no. The reason hard drive manufacturers have gone through brutal decades of consolidation is because it's really an economy, it's a scale game. If you have the technology to scale your design to create higher capacities at lower costs, you're able to go and drive higher volumes. Higher volumes mean lower per unit manufacturing costs, which means that you have more margins and you can go buy out your competitors. When you buy your competitors, you then rationalize on the best technology, have fewer drive designs in the market, which means that each drive design has higher volumes and therefore it makes it cheaper to manufacture. So for a manufacturer, SMR kind of makes sense. Lower manufacturing costs mean that you get either higher margin from the drive or you're able to hit a lower price point. Ultimately, that's actually really good for consumers to have options for capacity storage at lower price points because you know that is something that helps drive technology forward. These days, hard drive manufacturers generally see their volumes driven by large customers. And these are really, think of them like hyperscalers, you have large PC, you know, the HPEs, Dells of the world, HPs of the world, large PC and server OEMs and ODMs. Those guys are drive big volumes. You have some distributors that drive big volumes. You know, so there, there are a couple big customers, but these guys really don't want to have, you know, everybody that buys a $100, $200 hard drive being a customer because that's just cost too much to service. There are distribution channels for that. The flip side to that though, is that, you know, it really does make a hard drive manufacturer focus on the really big customers because those are the ones that drive volume and drive requirements in the industry. And if you look at where Western Digital was previously selling these undisclosed SMR drives that I just didn't tell anybody about or the undisclosed DM SMR drives, this was really in kind of the lower cost segments. I mean, the you know, two to six terabyte drive segments where cost is a big deal. I mean, these are not the most expensive devices. So if you can save 50 cents or a dollar per drive on manufacturing costs, because maybe you don't need that extra platter, or you don't need 
an extra head or whatever it is, by just saving a little bit on manufacturing costs or getting more volume on a single design, that actually helps the drive manufacturers deliver drives at lower costs. So using SMR actually is a way to get lower cost drives into the market. And Western Digital did something that's really kind of interesting. So not only did they come out and say, hey, we're doing this in some of our just kind of mainstream consumer drives, but they're also doing it in their WD Red drives. Now these are the NAS drives specifically designed for those decades old RAID arrays, RAID array technology in their NAS, NAS designs that really don't do super well with SMR when you kind of get out of that cache portion. But Western Digital's position that they laid out this week was basically, hey, you know, we didn't really need to disclose this, but you shouldn't be using these drives for things that we didn't intend you to use them for. And, you know, we'll give you a nice little table that kind of shows that for really the two to six terabytes segment that we're focusing on where the cost or cost is really a big deal. I mean, that's kind of a Western Digital statement. Now, the weird thing about Western Digital statement is the fact that it was by Western Digital. The Western Digital byline, when you look at it, is kind of interesting actually in this case. I mean, normally you would expect that you would see a byline from an executive that was sponsoring a message from the company, but we didn't get that in this case. We just got a by generic Western Digital was it an intern who, why, why, why is it just by Western Digital? It's weird. It should be by an executive. And the fact that no executive wanted to put their name on it, it was just kind of a really weird messaging thing that Western Digital did this week. Now, on the other hand, we've hit this point in the market where a one terabyte hard drive and a one terabyte SSD, you know, you're talking about something that's maybe $65, $70 for the hard drive. And you're talking about maybe $115, $120 for one terabyte, low end one terabyte SSD. So you're basically talking about the fact that there's only a $60 margin now. And a lot of people are going to say, hey, you know, for $60 more, I'm happy to go take the high reliability and higher performance of an SSD over a hard drive. So if you think about what these vendors have to contend with, it's that kind of market where they need to make a gap, especially at the lower end against these SSDs that are much smaller and have much lower shipping costs and distribution costs because they're physically smaller. And so if you think about it from a drive manufacturer perspective, they're doing a good thing. They're getting a capacity point at a lower cost. They're able to compete better against SSDs. I mean, this actually looks like a really good win for them. On the other hand, drive manufacturers know that SMR has a certain stigma. In fact, they've spent years teaching everybody in the industry that you want CMR drives. You don't want SMR unless you really want SMR. So now you can kind of see the drive manufacturer quandary. They've spent years drilling into the heads of everyone in the market that SMR technology, really good for capacity and slow storage and sl that kind of you know, usage model, but not necessarily a direct replacement for your hard drives that you'd use on a normal basis. So they've educated everybody to think that way. And now the way to go provide a lower cost drive in low cost segments is to use SMR. So if you're a company like a Western Digital, Seagate or Toshiba, now you have a dilemma on your hands. You've told everybody that SMR is not as good and there are technical reasons behind that, but now you're shipping them device or drive managed SMR drives. That's a quandary. And the weird thing about what the entire industry did, and it's kind of interesting that all three companies basically did the same thing at around the same time and you know in this kind of same pricing bracket where they just basically said hey you know what we're going to switch over to smr and we're not going to tell people so that has some big impacts and let's talk about what that impact is to the consumer okay so let us start with why people especially consumers and small businesses that buy drives and we're going to focus specifically on the nas drive use case the small nas drive use case Let's focus on why people go out and buy hard drives for those use cases. Small businesses, homes have their records, they have their digital assets, and there are things of real value and importance on NAS units. And really, if you think about it, that's what a hard drive is there for nowadays. We're really seeing a major shift in primary OS SSDs or primary OS drives and application drives to SSDs because that technology just frankly makes a lot more sense because of performance characteristics. Now, hard drives are still great for storing a lot of stuff very inexpensively, but you have to have trust. You have to have trust to put data on those drives that those drives are gonna work in that NAS environment, that they're gonna work in that RAID environment, 
because the records, the memories, even people's photos, think of the memories that people store on their NAS devices. I mean, these are precious to people. They're the livelihoods. If you own a small business and all your records are on that NAS, that is your livelihood. It's the livelihood of your family, your employees. I mean, that's a huge responsibility to have data stored, even on these low cost NAS units. But if you think about it, there are really two kinds of consumers out there. There's consumers that don't know about SMR, don't care, and they're just really not into technology and they just kind of assume anything's gonna work. And there are other consumers that actually do know what SMR is and they do know how things work and they have a strong preference, usually not for SMR, especially in this class. But if you think about it, those two classes of consumers really have one thing in common in this two terabyte to six terabyte space that is the focus of the recent discussion. They can't afford larger drives. The two to six terabyte market isn't really for people like myself or STH, small businesses like that, that can afford to go get larger drives. Instead, it's really for the folks that can afford it. And for folks in the US, it may be kind of weird because we think, oh, well, we have access to large drives are relatively inexpensive compared to US personal income. So why is that an issue? But we have to realize that the US isn't everywhere in the world. There are a lot of locations that have a lot different income disparity. They have a lot different currency exchange rates. There may be tariffs on different goods that make certain goods like electronics and hard drives a lot more expensive. And so there are a lot of places where people just physically or just can't afford more expensive drives. Sometimes it's not even just that they can't afford them, but you can't even get them. There are places in the world that don't have great electronics distribution like we have in the US. If you don't travel a lot and don't get outside of cities, you may not see that kind of dynamic, but you know, frankly, it's one that happens on a very large portion of Earth and most of the world's population actually falls into that. And personally, this kind of disparity in terms of distribution and purchasing power is something that I'm really trying to take into account as I you know, write pieces myself, as I edit the team's work and talk to the team. I mean, this is something that we're really trying to make sure that we're not blind to at STH. I don't always do the best job at it, and I'm probably the first person that's gonna admit something like that. I frankly could do a better job, but it is something that I'm very mindful of and really try to focus on as much as possible. I live in Silicon Valley, Mountain View, California, where Google is right down the street. We don't really have issues getting the latest technology here, but that's different than most places in the world. And if you look at where these two to six terabyte drives, where those are the options for someone to store their precious data, because you, know, you can't buy a 10 terabyte drive. You may not be able to even find one. When you look at that market, that's who really gets hurt by the lack of disclosure on the fact that these are SMR drives and potentially lack of choice. And I'm taking special note of Western Digital here because Seagate is still using CMR, or conventional recording technologies, on their Iron Wolf SSDs that are made for NAS. But Western Digital did something different. They're using SMR on their NAS drives. And as a result, those people that have that precious data that are making big investments to be able to put those that precious data onto NAS units, those are the people that are gonna be hurt if things happen, like drives get kicked from RAID arrays because it's actually an SMR drive rather than a conventional drive. Those are the people that get hurt. It's not the people that, you know, like me, that can go out and buy different things and have options in the market. It's the people that don't. So if we take a step back and we look at where we are, it's kind of sad, but we're in a pretty classical case. We have an oligopoly of basically three hard drive manufacturers that have decided to lower their manufacturing costs so they can squeeze out, you know, potentially more margin. They can lower costs of their products, which is not necessarily a bad goal by any means. But the big thing here is that they didn't disclose the fact that they were using it until they got basically found out and they got pushed on the issue. When you look at how these large manufacturers like Western Digital treat their larger customers, their hyperscale clients and those types of companies, if you look at the high-end hard drives, every single one of those says whether it's a SMR drive or it's a conventional magnetic recording device. You compare that to the lower end and those disclosures are being omitted. And they're being omitted because drive manufacturers know that they're basically selling an inferior product into the market. Now, given it's probably for pricing and margin reasons, sure, but 
they're not disclosing not because they don't, it's not something that a consumer would want to know. They're not disclosing because they're trying to hide the fact that it's SMR. Otherwise they would do the same thing that they do at the high end where, you know, this information is disclosed very regularly. And at this point, you know, giving this disclosure on something that could potentially be dangerous to someone's livelihood, to only customers that pay a lot of money versus those that, you know, probably be more impacted by it, but don't pay as much money. I mean, that kind of starts sounding like a movie that is not favorable towards large corporations. So it seems like the way forward is actually pretty easy and it doesn't really have to cost a lot of money. What we really need to do is we really need Western Digital, Seagate, and Toshiba to step up and always disclose and commit to always disclosing the recording technology and basic technology bits of their drives. That allows consumers to be informed and know that whatever product they're gonna get, they have some reasonable expectation of what they're, they're getting for their capital outlay. And frankly, if the hard drive manufacturers can't self-regulate and come up with honest disclosures. The fact that they're so important to so many people and the data that go on them are so important to so many people. The fact that there's only three manufacturers, there are huge barriers to entry because of getting that economies of scale, there are huge barriers to entry to getting into the market. So we're probably not gonna see more than three vendors ever again. One has to ask whether or not if these companies can't self-regulate if the governments of the world need to step in and start regulating how that information is disclosed to customers. Now, frankly, I am not a person that goes and says, hey, we need more regulation, we need more regulation. I don't like that. So I think a much preferable version of how this plays out is that WD, Seagate, and Toshiba all have executive sponsors that say we will put that on our spec sheets. Now printing the extra bit on the spec sheet basically costs not a lot, pretty much nothing. They already do it on most of their drives. They have the information. There's really net, nothing net new other than just putting that lie, line in a public spec sheet. So frankly, that is a much better and much preferred version of how this all plays out. Hopefully at the end of the day, they decide to do the right thing. To sum it up, I'm gonna offer this and doubly so to the WD executives who made the switch on the red NAS drives and didn't tell anyone and also put, did refuse to put their name on this week's blog posts. I'm gonna simply offer a thought. Just because someone or some business doesn't have the opportunity or means to purchase a higher end drive does not mean we should deprive them of being an informed consumer and disclose what type of recording technology is used in a device. This is people's lives and livelihoods, their families' livelihoods, their customers' livelihoods. It impacts an enormous number of people and we need to make sure that we're being good global citizens in the IT hardware community and let people make informed decisions for themselves. Hey guys, I know it's a little different than a lot of the videos that we've been doing recently, but it's something that's really important in the industry, or at least I think it's really important in the industry. And frankly, I'd love to hear your thoughts. So if you have thoughts, you know, check out the STH main site article on this. You can put comments there, put them in our forms. There's a comment section here on YouTube that you can go put your comments on and have to go read a whole bunch of those. I really want to hear your perspective. I think it's a big deal about, you know, and this is not just a simple normal CMR versus SMR issue. I think it's actually a much bigger issue in how we treat people in the global community as part of the tech community. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. As always, thanks for watching. If you like this video and kind of the stuff that we normally do, well, then why don't you subscribe to us on YouTube, hit that notification button, and check out all the great things that are coming. You can also see the other videos that we've uploaded on YouTube. Check out the STH main sites for great content that we're putting out every single day. And thanks again for watching and have an awesome day.